Thank you, Sally. So I've got five questions that I'm allowed to ask you, and um, I, I, I cannot wait to actually uh, hear and have a good discussion with you. But the, 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 my, my first question is really, you know, on this subject of the last... Well, I was born, I think, two years after you qualified, so this is like... A, um, <laughs> This is, this is actually quite, a, quite, quite an amazing thing. So how has medicine changed in your eyes, not just in the last 10 years, but really throughout the whole time as you as a medical professional? I think there's a social side to it. So I remember denying young patients renal dialysis because we didn't have enough. It was at the beginning. I remember finding it very brutalising working the 100-hour weeks and actually the lack of psychological support. But also, I did a TB job. I sat by the bed of a man with his feet tilted up, and he bled to death while I sat there through his mouth, from his lungs. And of course, there we are, the TB capital of Europe in London. World TB Day was last Friday. We've done vastly better in this country. We've seen genomics arrive. We've seen public health change from being the old-fashioned wash your hands, better housing, to really world-beating vaccination programs, though that's beginning to go off, um, wonderful screening programs, though we need to move on, to beginning to use genomics. We've seen the beginnings of gene therapy. One of my young doctors does the first gene therapy for haemophilia up at the Royal Free, world-beating. So dramatic change, so much and so fast that actually I hardly dare think about it. It's extraordinary. Um, so uh, m my next question to you is really about um, the last 10 years and what you see as the greatest successes that you've seen in your tenure as Chief Medical Officer. But also, I I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you feel we're not allowed to use the word failure anymore, are we? So, um, um, but what we see is the biggest gaps that you would hoped um, would have been filled uh, that you hadn't seen filled in that time. So I think there are three areas we can look at. One is kind of prevention and, and the public health. Um, one is medicine and treatment, uh, the illness service. Um, and I suppose the other is the more social aspects. So life expectancy has improved. Um, it's slowed down, but it's improving. But tragically, healthy life expectancy actually has gone a bit backwards over the last few years. So people may be living longer, but they're not living longer well. And that surely ought to be our objective. And that takes you back to what, why are they not well? Well, obesity, musculoskeletal problems, uh, sense problems, vision, hearing, uh, dementia, um, a lot of loneliness, psychological problems, and mental health issues have been on the rise. So there's that side. Um, we've had some great successes in public health. We've recognised obesity as a problem. I'm beginning to try and do something about it, but no magic bullet takes smoking. During the time I've been CMO, the government had moved to standardised packaging, uh, everything's hidden behind uh, white doors, banned smoking in, um, in cars, and smoking has continued to go down. I still worry about vaping. Of course, it's safer than smoking, but are vapors encouraging the young to go into smoking? But then you take the most deprived area of Britain, I think it's Morecambe, but up round there, and 28% of pregnant mums are smoking. And that's a massive damage to their health and to the health of the fetus and then the baby. So we're, we're not there with that sort of thing. So we've made strides, but we're not there. When you look at acute treatments, I mean, and you see what we can now do, whether you move from robotic surgery to immunotherapy to the 100,000 genome project and the 60,000 um, children with rare diseases where we've got rid of the diagnostic odyssey in the way it was there and we've upped the diagnostic rate. I mean, science is wonderful mm. and it's going to get better and better. So on, on, one, of those, on one of those subjects, I mean, 
the, the, this rising gap, I mean, it's surprising, like in, in the last 10 years, despite all of these advances in acute medicine, you mentioned that this gap between health span and lifespan is actually increasing. Um, and and I, I think the statistics are that that's not increasing in general, but it's actually, there's, there's, a, there's an equality gap that's grown. Absolutely. Indeed, for women in the lowest deciles of, um, of uh, income, their life expectant, healthy life expectancy has dropped even more than anywhere else and their life expectancy has fallen. So there's a real inequality. Um, you pick it up through the outcomes, you pick it up through income, it's there in education, it's there in every way. And as a society, we kind of pretend it's not happening. Sure, yeah. I think that's probably one of the core areas that we need to focus on is less about uh, you know, five-year survivals, progression-free survivals, and uh, and life expectancy. But actually, um, what can you know the measure of health expectancy uh, as being yeah. a concrete measure of outcome as well? Um, Absolutely. And I've, in my last annual report, called on government to put in place a composite health index that, that picks up on deprivation, that picks up on behavioural factors like obesity and smoking, as well as health outcomes. And I want them to measure this and put it next door to the GDP, mm. because I believe what gets measured gets sorted, managed. That would be a fantastic thing if every, if every outcome for every drug was, uh, was uh, also measured against those things too, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about vaccines. I saw you on television yesterday mm. um, about uh, talking talking about the measles, uh, the, the measles uh, rise. I think it was what a thousand cases found last year. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I mean, oh, this is n this is not going to be a question about should we get vaccinated. I think you'll be pleased to hear. Um, but uh, w what what do you think are the are still the fundamental drivers and concerns uh, in people, and what can we do about them in this sort of you know ability to communicate things that clearly are scientifically robust. Why are we, I think you mentioned something to do with we should, we should be talking to celebrities more uh, in order to communicate <laughs> rather than scientists, but uh, talk a little bit about that, how you think we can bridge those gaps. Well, we've got data that shows that um, around 90% or just over of people in this country trust the NHS and their general practitioners. And our rates for vaccination, are, uh, two doses, are running at about 87%. So we know we've got to keep going with that and the ways we do communicate to keep that level. We know that 2 or 3% will probably never believe they, they come from faiths where you know, that is not their belief. But it's that group in between that may grow bigger who are, well, don't know about it and whatever. And... It's clear that they often listen to anti-vaxxers and what's been happening, I'm told, is if you um, look up vaccination on social media and things, anti-vax stuff, which we all know is wrong, but it's coming up. So how do you counteract false news? Now, I'm not the expert and I'm probably far too old for this, but I do know that if you're using social media and you're getting it, you've got to use social media to go against it. While I don't really understand the use of celebrities because I like intellect and science, if that works, <laughs> do it. <laughs> well, I think you're something of a celebrity in our, in our community. Maybe we should try and get you a few, a few tens of millions of followers on Twitter um, or Instagram, perhaps. Um, yeah. Have you got an Instagram account? No. Oh, you see, there we go. Okay, one bit of thing we can... All you'd see is these wonderful meals of I love eating and cooking. <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 that might well be uh, the, the answer to my next question, which is what advice would you give to your successor, apart from um, <laughs> getting an Instagram account? Um, well, I don't know that I would advise while in office an Instagram account. Um, the Queen's got one. She's in office. Yes. <laughs> uh, and she, like me, she's very careful. Um, I do have to make sure I do not overreact too quickly. It's always better to sleep on things and think, so what does this mean? Or I could wind things up a lot, whether it's the newspapers, the public, or the ministers. And it's always much better to think about it. So advice? Well, clearly you have to do the security and the basic health bit. And that has to be based on evidence. But I also think that a, if I'm allowed to say I'm a good CMO, a good CMO gets the science and where's, where's it going 
and is bold. So the 100,000 Genome Project, you know, the science didn't say we could do it and we could afford it. David Cameron announced it, and yes, I was part of the announcement. I thought we should go for it. But then I found a way of setting up a startup company to make it happen because I believed that though we didn't know we could do it, by the sheer trying to do it, A, I thought we could crack it, and B, we would learn so much and patients would benefit from that learning that we had to do it. The, the other big example of my boldness, there have been a few, but the other one is National Institute of Health Research, which I conceived and set up. I mean, the big brains and big cheeses who said, you shouldn't do this, you can't do it, oh, even if you get the money, we'll take it away because you don't know how to do it. And yet, of course, they now think I'm a saint. <laughs> so you have to be bold, but based on science. And um, w will you get an opportunity to, to convey these things to your successor? Oh, yes. I yes. think I'm going to do like the Prime Minister and, and the senior ministers, leave a letter. Excellent. <laughs> Um, so talking of letters, what, what, uh, what message would you give to budding scientists, doctors, medical students, entrepreneurs, innovators, technologists um, for, for their next 10 years of uh, exploration and advancement of science and medicine? Well, I suppose I'd come back to be bold, believe in yourself and enjoy it. Because if, if you don't believe in it, you're not enjoying it and you're not bold, you won't deliver anything. And do you, do you think that the UK is now the best place in the world to be doing this, as opposed to maybe Silicon Valley or...? I think it's been getting better, yeah. But, you know, we can always do even better. Indeed so, indeed so. Whether we investors in the audience, do you hear that? Yes, <laughs> subject. Yeah, but we're doing well. <laughs> we are doing a much better indeed. I mean, I remember when uh, we first started doing Wired Health, um, I, I mean, in, in the, the, the level of innovation that was happening in the UK versus in different parts of the world was, you know, it really was worlds apart. And now I think, especially in areas of neuroscience and even antimicrobial resistance mm. and uh, AI, and I, I, I do think that this is possibly one of the best cities and countries in the world to be. Uh, so then we uh, get back to the British problem. How do we take all this innovation and this science to make a difference, whether it's getting it into practice or making a profit, which translates into a tax benefit that I can spend on the public's health. Yeah. I don't mind which it is, but we mustn't do the old-fashioned failing of discovering it and letting others reap the advantage. We, we, we did that a lot, indeed, yeah, we did. In, including genomics itself yeah. and gene sequencing, indeed so. Um, I've got... I've got a final uh, question for you uh, before wrapping up. Um, I'd love you to know what your next grand challenge is. What are you going to be doing over the next 50 years? So, so I'm not giving up AMR. I think um, with agreement with the government, I want to go on playing a role globally in raising awareness and pushing that. It's, I think, too early. But I'm moving on to this wonderful role that Trinity is their new master. And so... I've not worked in the education sector apart from doing research and funding research, but it seems to me we do have a problem. How do we find the brightest and best in the poorest and the most remote bits of Britain, <coughs> remote from Cambridge anyway, and help them to benefit? Because we owe it to them, but actually to keep Trinity and Cambridge at the top, and Oxford or arguably all of them, we've got to do that. Absolutely. Um, May I wrap up with my three learnings from our wonderful conversation? Um, I would say that they are, be careful about vaping. <laughs> yes. Um, be bold in order to make a difference. And definitely sleep on it before you post something on Insta. <laughs> I, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your amazingly busy day um, to come and speak to us. Um, you have been po possibly single-handedly one of the most Im important drivers of science, technology and innovation in, the, in medicine uh, over the last 10 years and throughout your career. Uh, can't thank you enough for your service, can't thank you enough for your time and please join me in giving a very um, big round of applause to Dame Sally Davis. <laughs> <laughs>